Welcome to Babel, Translating the Middle East, a podcast from the Middle East program at CSIS. Here on Babel, we take you beyond the headlines to take a closer look at what's happening in the Middle East and why it matters. Since Egypt's 2011 revolution, Egyptian politics have been reshaped time and time again. This week, we're joined by Killian Clark, the author of a forthcoming book tentatively entitled The Return of Tyranny, How Counter-Revolutions Emerge and Succeed. He's an assistant professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, and way back in the summer of 2008, he was an intern in the Middle East program at CSIS. He's the first former intern to appear on Babel. To translate some of what's happening in the Middle East, this is Babel. Killian, welcome to Babel. Thanks for having me, John. It's really great to be back here. You wrote a really interesting manuscript about to be published as a book called The Return of Tyranny, How Counter-Revolutions Emerge and Succeed. What's it about? The book is a study of counter-revolution. It's a study of counter-revolution globally and historically through time. It tries to theorize and conceptualize the topic of counter-revolution, which actually hasn't received a lot of treatment in academic scholarship. And then perhaps most importantly for today's conversation, it's also a detailed study of Egypt's 2013 counter-revolution. I have been working on Egypt for most of my academic career, and I wanted to use the case of Egypt and what happened in Egypt in 2013 to understand how counter-revolutions work. Because one of the things that I was struck by when the 2013 coup in Egypt happened was that we didn't have a great sense of how common this was, how often it had occurred in other places of the world and other historical time periods. So sort of in classic comparative politics mode, I wanted to study this phenomenon of counter-revolution as a general phenomenon and understand how Egypt fit in. How common are counter-revolutions? I built a data set of counter-revolutions globally. I started with a data set of revolutions because in my understanding of counter-revolution, you need to have a successful revolution. It's a precursor. Exactly. And I understand counter-revolution as the return of the old regime following a successful revolution. I identified 22 instances globally from 1900 to the present of this thing that we saw in Egypt happening in other parts of the world. What makes a counter-revolution more likely and what makes it less likely? I split the outcome into two parts, the attempt of the old regime to return and then whether it can do so successfully. Counter-revolutionary attempts are tied to things that you might expect, things like the structure of the old regime, whether the old regime has a very powerful military apparatus, right? A lot of the sort of ideas that were put forward following the Egyptian counter-revolution. Counter-revolutionary success is attributable to other dynamics. It's attributable more to dynamics within the transition itself, and crucially, whether revolutionaries lose the crucial resource that they have at the end of the revolution, which is leverage over the old regime. And that's really what I see as exemplary in the Egypt case, that revolutionaries after 2011, they had a degree of leverage over the old regime, even though the military was powerful, even though the scaff was hanging over the whole transition. Is the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, exactly. The coalition of revolutionary forces, at least for that initial period in Egypt, had a high degree of leverage over the military, and they lost that leverage over the course of essentially a year after Mohamed Morsi was elected president. And it was only when an opportunity emerged for the military to come back that they were able to step in and seize power and reclaim the role of the supreme leaders of Egypt. Without that opportunity, that was formed, I think, essentially in the spring of 2013, Egypt might have been able to continue on the transition that it was on and continued on its path towards democracy. And you made the suggestion in the book that there was a sort of understanding between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military that helped the Muslim Brotherhood come to power in the elections in 2011. There was an understanding at first. I think there was a tacit agreement, essentially, between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood because they had a set of shared interests. They had an interest in establishing democratic institutions quickly. They had an interest in getting people off the streets and into the electoral institutions. They had this convenient alliance at the end of 2011. That alliance that they formed changed once Mohamed Morsi was elected. Mohamed Morsi 
in my reading of events, did everything that he could to try to placate the military. He actually tried quite hard to give the military what they wanted. But when Abdel Fattah al-Sisi became the Minister of Defense, the relationship between Morsi and Sisi was not good. And that alliance that the Brotherhood and the military formed back in 2011 didn't prove to be very durable. By the middle of Morsi's presidency, things were not very strong between Sisi and Morsi. In your judgment, was the Brotherhood's mistake that it was too conciliatory toward the military or not conciliatory enough, or was there some other mistake? In my reading, the Brotherhood prioritized the wrong things. The government was not strong. Right, So they were trying to manage all kinds of competing priorities. They were trying to manage a declining economy. They were trying to satisfy the needs of all these different social groups. They were trying to figure out what to do with the old regime actors. And then they also had the other half of the revolutionary coalition, what we refer to as the secularist half. They were trying to figure out how to include them in the government or not. I think they prioritized the wrong things. I think that they should have prioritized keeping the cohesion of their revolutionary coalition. They should have tried to govern with a much more inclusive approach. Morsi should have offered genuine power and positions in his government to members of these secularist groups. And I think he should have deprioritized the attempts to placate the old regime. Because if they had maintained that coalition unity, and if they had continued to maintain the social base of the revolution, if the military had attempted a coup, the entire base of the revolution would have gone back into the streets and back into protest. And that would have been a way to stop a coup from successfully occurring. And I actually see this play out in other cases through history, where you have a weak democratic government, a strong military attempts to come back to power, and the revolution is essentially rerun. People pour back out into the streets. Where did that happen? It happened after the 2014 uprising in Burkina Faso. In 2015, immediately after the uprising, the military attempted a coup. And people poured back out into the streets, the entire revolutionary coalition, all the civil society groups, and they reversed the coup within a week. It happened in Bolivia in 1982. There was a popular uprising there. It happened in several other Latin American countries. It happened in certain countries in East Asia following democratic uprisings. This is actually a pattern we see in what I think are comparable cases. In 2011, you saw miniature versions of this happening when the SCAF charged a member of the secularist opposition with writing a document that would essentially give it extra constitutional power, the revolutionary coalition went back into the street to protest and actually got them to reverse these things. I think you see miniature versions of this happening in Egypt as well. And I think if this coalition had remained relatively united, at least rallied behind the revolutionary goals, then it might have been able to stop any coup that was attempted. To play a counterfactual, it sounds to me like You feel that there's the possibility that the Brotherhood had a genuine democratic instinct. As you think back, did it have the potential to be profoundly democratic? Because, for example, some of my friends who were aligned with the Noor party, a Salafi party, felt that the Brotherhood was always exclusivist. The Brotherhood was always hierarchical. The Brotherhood was always going to be hostile to genuinely engaging with a broader public. The Brotherhood was always an elitist institution and therefore was oriented toward following the military's model. The way I would respond to that is that there's a lot of what I would call anti-democratic actors that function successfully in democratic systems. Democracy without Democrats argument. Exactly. I don't know if the Muslim Brotherhood are committed Democrats or not. And I don't know if it actually matters that much, because I think if you have a political system in place with the right institutions and the right balance of power, that even actors that don't necessarily have genuine democratic commitments can be forced to operate by democratic rules of the game. And I think that if we had allowed the transition in Egypt to continue, we might have seen that kind of balance of power emerge. I think the Brotherhood were very unpopular by the middle of 2013. If we had allowed those parliamentary elections that were supposed to take place to occur, they might not have done very well. Then you would have had a balance of power between a Brotherhood-dominated presidency and a perhaps opposition-dominated parliament. And we would have been able to see how this played out. I'm not sure it really matters whether or not the Brotherhood are committed to democracy or not. 
through all the security services, internal security services, the Mukhabarat and other internal intelligence organs in Egypt, there was a lot of commentary after Sisi came to power that they had engineered that, that they were the ones who were behind it. How do you assess that? And if that's true, how were they able to pull the strings in such a way that they got what they were looking for? I looked into this pretty carefully for my book because I was really interested in this thesis. I looked into the origins of the Tamarud movement, which is this counter-revolutionary movement that really spearheaded the mass protests that created the opportunity for the coup. And it's true that they had connections to the security services. They met with them. They took money from them. I don't dispute that. Where I push back a little bit on the thesis is the kind of causal importance of all of this, right? And I think that the popular support behind the Tamarud movement was not manufactured. It was genuine. People had all kinds of disaffections in Egypt by the middle of 2013. Some of them were political, some of them were not. And all of that got channeled into the Tamarud movement. And of course, there are arguments that the intelligence services were creating cuts in electricity and worsening the traffic in Tahrir Square and all sorts of things. I mean, there was a perception the country was falling apart, but there was also a perception that it was the deep state that was fraying people's nerves. Yeah, you have to assume the deep state has a lot of power and influence to imagine that they have that level of omnipotence in staging this event. I just don't think they're that good. I mean, there were perhaps incidents of meddling and attempts to sow unrest but I think most of that was genuine. And I actually trace it with the protest data set. It goes back even to before Morsi was elected, right? The power cuts, the social unrest, the issues over labor that were happening in the governorates, all of that predates certainly the spring of 2013 and even the start of the Morsi administration. So I think there was something more genuine behind this mass movement. And I also see this again with the comparative cases. I see this in other parts of the world where we see successful counter-revolutions. You see a similar dynamic where society is aggrieved at the state of post-revolutionary affairs and they channel those grievances into support for restoration because they yearn for order and they yearn for security. And that's, I think, what happened in Egypt. Let me ask you about the security question. You said, I don't think they're that good, but I was struck that all the interviews in your book, you did 93 interviews in 10 cities, all anonymously, partly for your security and partly for the security of people you interviewed. How does the security concern influence the work you've done and how do you think it shaped how people were willing to talk to you? The security concern was huge. It was so huge that I almost changed the project because when I started doing this research, it was 2017. It was a year after Julia Regeni had been murdered. Julia Regeni was a PhD student working on labor issues in Egypt who was murdered and most likely murdered by members of the security forces. I had a conversation with my advisor after that and we talked about maybe scrapping the project or fundamentally changing it. In the end, I went ahead with it, but I went ahead with it with a large number of security safeguards in place, including the ones that you mentioned. It undoubtedly affected the types of people I was able to speak to. I mean, most obviously, the majority of the Islamist piece of the story, those members were not available because they were in prison. I was able to speak to a number of brotherhood leaders living in exile, but the key figure is it was impossible to speak to them. There was also fear in Egypt and elsewhere a lot of people wouldn't meet with me because they didn't want to discuss these issues. I did the best I could. I was able to speak to more people than I thought I was. And I was doing the research in Egypt at a time, 2017 and 2018, before things got really bad and people were still willing to meet mostly during that time. But it was difficult. It was definitely challenging. A lot of the interviews, if I can read between the lines, seem to be elite level interviews. What do you think you would have learned if you spoke to more non-elite people, get more non-elite voices into your research? I mean, I tried to speak to non-elites, but the interview part of the project is really an elite story. I imagine if I had done more interviews with non-elites, people outside of Cairo, et cetera, I would have had more evidence to support this piece of the story I just talked about, this sort of social disaffections that emerged over the course of the transition, what those looked like, and then most importantly, how those 
ultimately were channeled into support for counter-revolution. So let me ask you about your own professional trajectory. As we were talking about earlier, you did your senior thesis at Harvard on the Kafaya movement, a protest movement, and then you're getting your master's at NYU and you have the Egyptian revolution break out, but you're in management consulting, you're working for McKinsey and you say, no, I think I really want to get a PhD here. And you think you're going to be working maybe on the Egyptian revolution, end up writing about the Egyptian counter revolution. Can you just help me understand from the Killian Clark perspective, what that arc is from the Kafaya movement, seemingly ineffectual to a revolution, to a counter revolution, to where? Great question. So I began all of this as an undergrad. I did this undergraduate thesis. It was my first time doing research on this social movement called Kifaya, which was a pro-democracy social movement that emerged in 2005 to challenge the Mubarak regime that everyone at the time, including me, thought was pretty ineffectual. In fact, that was the framing of the whole project. How do ineffectual social movements emerge under authoritarianism? And then I was doing my master's thesis at NYU and the revolution happened. And I was reading all of these accounts of what was happening. And of course, it was tremendously exciting. All of these people that I had spoken to for the undergraduate thesis were giving interviews to the New York Times and Al Jazeera and BBC. And I thought, gosh, this is interesting. These are the same people I was talking to. And I went back that summer and I did this research for my master's thesis. The interesting thing was that at that point, I already was planning to take a job at McKinsey after my master's degree. I wasn't planning to continue in academia, but I had so much fun doing this research and it was so exciting and it was so invigorating that I really started the job at McKinsey kind of knowing already that I didn't want to stay. I worked there for two years and then I applied to this PhD at Princeton. And at that point, the counter-revolution had happened. So I actually wrote my PhD application proposing to do a project on counter-revolution. So yeah, I've had these sort of three academic experiences, and each one of them has been tied to a different moment in Egypt's political history. You've done some other interesting work on mobilization, sort of broadly considered in refugee camps in Jordan and other places. How does your Egypt work shape the way you think mobilization works? I see mobilization as, you know, the first step towards revolution. I mean, they're in the same family, right, of types of political activities. Although so, in places like Jordan, you have routinized mobilization that almost seems like people playing roles. No, that's true. It's not this sort of teleological thing where, you know, every protest is inevitably one step towards revolution. That's, that's not the way it works. They're in the same family of activities. And so I consider myself scholar of protest and mobilization and social movements broadly. And sometimes that means studying revolution, and sometimes it means studying other types of protest and popular resistance, like the project that looked at protest in refugee camps. I think they're certainly in the same genus, if you would. And so I think many of the mechanisms that explain one can be useful for explaining the other. You've returned to Washington. You are at a school of foreign service. You are writing about things of public policy importance. As you look at the work you've done, what do you think the policy implications are? What are the lessons people in the policy world should take from your work? How should they apply it? There was one piece that I wrote that looked at the role of the U.S. government in the transition in Egypt. I have this concept of ambivalent allies that I'm working with in this article. And I think that describes the role of the United States during the transition pretty well. The U.S. didn't really know how it felt about this transition. And part of this was because of differences within Obama's foreign policy team. There were some folks that were very enthusiastic about the prospect of democracy in Egypt and wanted to really support the transition. And there were other folks that were really skeptical. And I think this manifested in a really inconsistent sort of stance towards the Morsi government and towards the transition in general that really starts right from the beginning, right from when the revolution breaks out. And I think that was extremely unhelpful in that case, because I think the Morsi government misread those signals, and they only listened to the positive signals, and they thought that they had strong backing from Washington. And I think that informed their calculation to govern in a more exclusivist way, because they thought they had this big, powerful ally standing behind them. And then they found out only too late that actually that wasn't true. To get back to your original question, I think, as the United States has done in other parts of the world, 
there can be a much more full-throated stance of support for these pro-democracy movements and these democratic uprisings when they happen and they continue to happen across the region. And relatedly, I think the U.S. government can do a lot more to rein in the primary counter-revolutionary actors in the region who are Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Because if we look across the region and across you know, all the different places where there have been uprisings in 2011 and 2019, the one common denominator we see across all these failures is the role of these two actors. And I think the U.S. government can do more to try to rein these actors in so that these democratic transitions can be allowed to flourish and continue. Gillian Clark, welcome back to CSS, and thank you for joining us on Babel. Thanks a lot, John. It's been great to be with you. It seems that Egypt has done this loop where it went back to where it started. If the Egyptian revolution was essentially about overthrowing military rule back in 2011, how is it that the Egyptian military stayed in control? Egyptian military never lost control. The Egyptian military pushed Mubarak out, but remained in control. The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces maintained control. The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces negotiated the terms of the elections. And the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and its successors were always in the background and never left the scene. When they got to the end of their patience with President Mohamed Morsi, that was the end of President Mohamed Morsi. So it seems to me that it was never a complete revolution. It was only the army stepping back from an overt role and then stepping back into an overt role. And you actually saw that within the revolution. The revolutionaries themselves, the protesters themselves, were trying to get the military on their side because they knew it could never be successful unless the military essentially stepped down. So that's exactly what you saw. And I think what you see now with Sisi in this counter-revolution is that he's essentially trying to use everything in his power to ensure that the military stays on his side and use patronage to keep the military centered around him, which is easier because he is a military man himself. The iconography after the revolution was of soldiers assisting citizens. And even there was a sense that the military was turning against the domestic intelligence services on the side of the people. After the revolution, the military had 80% approval ratings. It was public approval of the military that let the military come back in July 2013. I think one of the interesting things that's happening now is, as far as we can tell, support for the military is starting to diminish. There's frustration with the military. There's frustration with the military's economic role, frustration with the military's standing. Some people are starting to whisper that maybe President Sisi is a liability rather than asset. I wouldn't say that any of these revolutions are necessarily against the military per se. I think all of these regimes are fairly good at having a dividing line between the Mkhabarat or the intelligence services, which have a bad reputation, and the military apparatus. And so I think that to a large degree, all of these protesters know that they need to either bring the military onto their side or make them step down. Let's take a look at one of Egypt's regional neighbors, Tunisia, the spark of 2011. For a while, we all thought that they were very well on their way towards democratic reform. But enter Qais Saeed. Do you see Qais Saeed in Tunisia as representing a counter-revolution? To a certain degree, yes. It's hard to argue that the trajectory of what's happening is the antithesis of what the revolution was supposed to embody. The difference is that he's not a military man. And he's not from the security service and not from the Ancien regime. So he's going to have to have patronage to a certain degree in order to stay in power and consolidate power. So how does he do that as a civilian so that he can at least create this core to really solidify that counter-revolution? What we've seen him do is go after the people he can go after, migrants, refugees. We've seen this kind of performative violence amongst people that maybe your average Tunisian doesn't care so much about, but it shows them what he's willing to do. It seems to me that what Kaisai fits into is a Middle Eastern pattern of populist authoritarianism. Democracy wasn't popular from the point of view of Tunisians. 
democracy produced corruption and efficiency. It didn't improve the economy. It didn't improve the, the performance of government. And what Kai Said has promised is we're going to push out all that inefficiency and all that self-dealing, and I will represent you in delivering to the people. The reality is that kind of populism has worked. It's generally worked for Abu Fattah Sisi in Egypt. It's generally worked for Kai Said in Tunisia. Things in Tunisia are getting worse. But people don't think that the alternative to Kai Saeed is returning to more democratic governance. If anything, they're looking for a third alternative. But democratic governance didn't acquit itself well. And in 2011, there was an assumption that all the protests were about people want democracy. People want better outcomes. And in Tunisia, people don't think, having experienced democracy, that it led to better outcomes. They thought it led to worse outcomes, and they're still impatient for better ones. Do you think that the U.S. government specifically should have acted a certain way to stop these counter-revolutions? Is there anything it did to make the counter-revolutions more likely? First, I don't think there are a lot of counter-revolutions. There are more failed revolutions in the Middle East, and some of those wars are still going on. I think one of the things that Americans have learned about the Middle East in the last 20 years is it's really hard to change other societies from afar when the stakes that the American policymakers have are so much less than the stakes of the antagonists in the battle. And certainly there are things the U.S. can do. But I think from the Bush administration's enthusiasm for a forward strategy of freedom to the Obama administration's sense during the Arab Spring that the the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. There really was this sense that the United States could be decisive in some of these instances. And I think what we're seeing now, and it's not just in the Middle East, is a sense the United States can play a role, but oftentimes the decisive role is played by people on the ground. I would say that the Obama administration was caught off guard by the Arab Spring. It was their instinct to come in and immediately demand dictators step aside. It had no way of answering to what would happen thereafter. There were a lot of people within the Obama administration, including Secretary of State Kerry, that were uncomfortable with that, and it, definitely more uncomfortable as the Muslim Brotherhood then came to power. And so I think that they lacked the strategic vision to drive that a bit, not to say that they're going to drive it or are able to drive it, but they can certainly guide it in a country like Egypt that they've had a lot of investment over the years. I disagree. I think their argument was that we will support the Brotherhood because it's a process and we'll support the Brotherhood running for election. If it's performing poorly, the Brotherhood will lose the election and the U.S. was committed to process. The generals in Egypt said, leave the process aside. We don't have time for process. The Brotherhood is ruining the country. And then you had this standoff between the Obama administration and Sisi when the Obama administration was bending over backwards not to call Sisi's coming to power a coup because that would trigger different aspects of U.S. law and prevent the U.S. from providing assistance to Egypt. But the U.S. was committed to process in Egypt and then found itself with potential partners who didn't believe in process, they were focused on outcomes. And it's led to what I think is an enduring level of tension between the U.S. and Egypt, certainly in democratic administrations and Egypt. And we're not sure if there's an exit from this. I think there are a lot of things that affect the U.S.-Egyptian bilateral relationship. But the scarring from a sense that C.C seized power illegitimately and has to bear some consequences of that is going to have a durable impact on the bilateral relationship. It won't end it, but it'll certainly cast a shadow over it for some time to come. And maybe that's what the consequence of U.S. policy is. You can't change what happens in Egypt, but it's hard to have the kind of intimate relationship we've had with Egypt when you have a government that came to power by 
pushing aside an elected government. David Kirkpatrick has a book out about this period of time, the revolution, the aftermath, and the counter-revolution. And one thing that he teases out is that there was a divide within the Obama administration about how to handle this. There were the idealist ones that were said, let's give the Muslim Brotherhood a try, wait for the election, let the Egyptian people decide. If they don't function well, if they don't provide services, they move on. And then there were the others that, again, were very uncomfortable, I think, with the Muslim Brotherhood in the first place and saw Sisi's takeover, genuinely saw it probably as not a coup, but saving Egypt. At one point, the Middle East was a bipartisan issue. And now we're going to see these little fluctuations both within administrations and across administrations with the idea in mind that the Middle East is not going to be a priority anymore either. So do we need a strategic vision for the Middle East? You certainly need a broader purpose for what you're trying to do, and the Middle East has to fit into it. Where democracy fits into the broader U.S. strategy for the Middle East, I think is potentially a different question. There's a question of where democratization should fit into the broader U.S. foreign policy strategy. It certainly played an important role early in the articulation of the Biden administration's policy, but it's hard to sustain. And there's been a whole bunch of commentary now. Foreign affairs had a big issue about unalignment and this whole movement among large states that are not part of the global power structure to become more of one. And there's a sense there's some hypocrisy involved in the U.S. calling for human rights, but giving military assistance to 35 out of 50 countries led by dictators around the world. My instinct is that you're never going to be pure enough to not be inconsistent. The idea that the answer to the U.S. around the world is we just have to be consistent and true to our principles strikes me as probably not practical or even desirable, which isn't to say that we shouldn't have a broader sense of goals in the Middle East, a sense of what we're willing to commit in the Middle East, a sense of what we're willing to accept in the Middle East, even if we don't like it. My perception is that a lot of that is done on the fly currently. And I think the administration would do better, not necessarily to articulate it all in public, but at least to give a sense for where its priorities are, if not by what it does. Because the consensus now is that the U.S. is on its way out the door. And my sense is that doesn't help the United States. It doesn't help U.S. partners in the Middle East. And it does help U.S. adversaries. And when you add that up together, that's not a policy that's serving your interests. And on that note, John, Natasha, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Lubna. Thanks, Lubna. Thanks for listening to Babel. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find more analysis on this topic linked in the show notes on the CSIS website, and you can find us on Twitter at CSIS Mideast. Thank you.